Excellent. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce another uh, old friend and colleague, um, Michael Papadakis. And Michael is um, uh, another imager, uh, inherited cardiac diseases expert, sports cardiologist. Um, and he is now the president of the European Association of Preventative Cardiology um, and has done a huge amount of work with um, not only locally and nationally, but uh, on the European uh, scene. Uh, in terms of guidelines for exercise in individuals who are diagnosed to have not just inherited cardiac conditions, but but uh, all sorts of cardiac conditions. Um, so, Michael, thanks very much for joining us. Um, and um, uh, over to you, Michael. Thank you. Wonderful. I uh, hope you can hear me fine. Uh, thank you very much for the very kind invitation. So you had two excellent talks on pre-participation screening and one on differentiating athletes' heart from pathology. And now we we'll look at exercise recommendations in those individuals who have inherited cardiac conditions, not only their athletic individuals. Uh, this is my only conflict of interest, but I don't think it's particularly related to this uh, talk. But cardiac risk in the young is a chart that has done a lot of work uh, in the field of uh, uh, preventing sudden cardiac death in young individuals. So what I will do, and I'll be very quick, quick quite swift with it because there is a lot of material to cover, is give you a basic outline of exercise prescription and the new guidelines that were published in 2020. It's a really nice document and I will really invite you to go and read it and have it by your side when you're seeing patients with inherited cardiac conditions. But I'll have to focus in a condition, I'll focus on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and then present you an overview of the rest of the cardiomyopathies and nine channelopathies and then we can potentially discuss them later on in a bit more detail because each one is a talk on its own right. Now what I thought is I will start with a case presentation for you and I'll give you to answer a poll as well. So we've got a 27 year old who is an IT consultant. He is a semi-professional football player who trains twice a week and plays a game over the weekend. He goes regularly to the gym for strength uh, training sessions. He's completely asymptomatic with no personal history. He's not on any regular medication, but he gets referred to your clinic because there is a familial diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, diagnosing his half brother. And there is a death in his father from alleged uh, pneumonia. Now, this is the 12th lead DCG, and I'm not going to teach you how to read the 12th lead DCG. This is pretty standard, and uh, you can see that there are overt abnormalities. So I'm not trying to challenge you in terms of a diagnosis, but you can clearly see that there are widespread T wave inversions that uh, affect the anterior leads as well as the high lateral leads 1 and AVL with associated ST segment depression, which we know it's an abnormal finding. And then we've got those pathological Q waves in the inferior leads. So I think reasonably enough, you will be expecting to find hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in this individual in the context of his family history. And indeed, your transthoracic echocardiogram demonstrates asymmetric septal hypertrophy. And I'm trying to point out here the anterior and anterior septum, which is far thicker compared to the lateral wall. And you'll see that in your strain imagery, the longitudinal strain is far reduced in the hypertrophied area. So the echo comes back as asymmetric left ventricular hypertrophy of 21 millimeters, dilated left atrium, no significant uh, LVOT gradient, and normal right ventricular size and function. And what we did next, which I suspect is what most of you will do, is we proceeded to a maximal cardiopulmonary exercise test. And you can see from the test that he is a really fit individual as he performed extremely well. Of importance, there was no evidence of arrhythmia and there was a normal blood pressure response to exercise. And the absence of arrhythmia was confirmed also on 24-hour ECG monitor. And because I know that we've got a great audience of uh, individuals who are very keen on cardiac MRI, I'm just presenting you the scenes of his cardiac MRI. For those who are less experienced, this is the two-chamber view, and you can see nicely the very hypertrophied anterior wall if you compare it with the inferior wall. And these are the short axis views from base going towards the mid of your left ventricle, and again, the asymmetric anterior to anteroseptum wall hypertrophy is clearly evident. 
And if you focus now on the late gadolinium enhancement images, I have highlighted for you here the spotty late gadolinium enhancement indicating a degree of myocardial fibrosis in the hypertrophied area, which is very common in individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And now what I want to ask you, and I want you to put your responses on the chat, is what is your exercise advice, okay? I know that some of the answers are contradicting each other, but I want you to tell me what would you put emphasis on? Is it A, that you can continue with competitive football? B, you can continue, but once we implant an ICD to make you safe? C, you definitely have to stop competitive football. D, consider alternative competitive sports, so maybe riding or cycling, but not football. And E, consider recreational exercise. So what will be the emphasis on your message on this 27 asymptomatic individual who plays competitive football and has a 22 millimeter asymmetric septal hypertrophy with some gadolinium enhancement in the hypertrophied area? I think I'll just leave you a few seconds to think about it. Then I'll probably tell you what my advice will be, but then we'll go through that in a bit more detail and explain why that's the case. So we're getting a few E's. There must be other responses as well. We've got a C, stop competitive football. A few C's actually. Good, okay. Keep thinking about it and we'll go back to it uh, uh, during the rest of the presentation, okay? But I, I went more with E rather than C and I'll explain to you why, okay? Now, First of all, it's very important to uh, reiterate, and you all know that, that exercise in general is very beneficial to our cardiovascular health. It reduces cardiovascular events, it reduces cardiovascular risk factors, and it also prolongs life. So individuals who exercise around that area of uh, 10 to 20 meta hours per week tend to gain in their population basis about uh, three years of extra life. But always the concern has been that if you go to the very high intensity and competitive level, particularly individuals who have an underlying cardiac condition, such as inherited cardiac conditions, then that benefit may be lost and they may predispose to malignant arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. So, unfortunately, as such, what's been happening is in terms of providing individualized prescription, we have been stopping individuals from participating in competitive sport for sure, but also in high intensity training. And in many circumstances, that has translated to no exercise at all. Now, this is what ideally you should be doing with any patient with a cardiac condition. You should take a good history in terms of their condition, in terms of the current level of exercise, so their current fitness level, what are they doing at this point and what do they intend to do or what they want to do in the future, then you should perform the necessary evaluation and ideally end up with an individualized exercise prescription. And I would like to know how many of us do that in our regular ICC clinics. Now, to help with that, we've got the 2020 ESC guidelines uh, that try to provide an outline of the patient's assessment. So they provide a very structured approach, and that's why I think it's a very useful document that you should keep by your side. It definitely takes into consideration the athlete's wishes and addresses exercise across different levels. So this is not a document for elite athletes alone. It's a document for exercise in individuals with cardiac conditions, including individuals with inherited cardiac conditions. Now, what these guidelines have done compared to previous guidelines and recommendations is that they've taken a more liberal approach, and rightly so, by re-evaluating and rethinking of the available data. Now, it's important to note that most of us, when we're thinking whether the particular individual, let's say hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, could exercise, we're thinking what is the risk of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for this individual? 
But I will argue that although this is an important question to answer, it is the wrong question to ask for this particular exercise. The question that your patient is asking you is whether exercise is potentially deleterious in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So essentially what they're asking you is, does it increase the risk of malignant arrhythmias and sudden death if I continue playing competitive football? And if not, does it potentially adversely affect my condition? And the honest truth is that we don't have evidence for either of that. Now, let's start with recreational exercise because that concerns the great majority of your patient. We've got a couple of studies. This is a published study called the Reset HCM, where they took a fairly large cohort of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients and they randomized them to either a moderate intensity exercise training or usual activity. The program lasted for up to 16 weeks. They got them to moderate intensity training and what they realized is that they, those individuals, they got fitter, they improved their quality of life with no significant adverse events in terms of uh, sustained ventricular tachycardias or sudden cardiac death. Of caution, there was slightly increased incidence of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia in the exercise group, but overall the message was positive accepting that this is not necessarily a study power to prove safety in the HCM population. Now, very briefly, I wanted to show you some uh, results from a study that uh, one of our fellows, Joey Basu, and one of our colleagues uh, has completed here at St. George's, where Joey took 80 individuals that she randomized them to a cardiac rehabilitation sort of program that was monitored here at St. George's, and 40 that had usual NHS care. And here we try to go for a younger population and push them at high intensity, 85% of heart rate reserve. And the results was very similar to the recent HCM study. So we identified that fitness levels improved, cardiovascular risk factors improved, and anxiety and depression scores improved on those individuals. And on the other hand, we had no signal of increased arrhythmia in the exercise compared to the uh, more sedentary group. The last study I wanted to present very briefly to you is that study from a Norwegian colleagues that they've done a number of studies. They, they collect their cohorts and then they go retrospectively and they see how much exercise have they been doing through their lifetime. They've done that from ARVC and they demonstrated that exercise and ARVC is a bad combination. They've done it for laminopathies and they demonstrated the same thing. They tried to do it for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy results demonstrated that the event rate and age of arrhythmic events were very similar irrespective of how much individuals were exercising. So I think given that base evidence base, we can say that recreational exercise is definitely beneficial and appears to be safe, even at high intensity level for most individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I will argue that this is very nice poster from the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which essentially resembles the World Health Organization recommendations, should be your absolute baseline. You need to have a very good reason to go below the 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise, combined with some uh, strength training as well as some balance training. Now, moving on to a bit of a more complicated issue because lots of questions were asked about competitive sports. Now, we've always been very worried about competitive sports and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that predominantly comes from registries of sudden cardiac death in athletic individuals, like the one you see on your slide where hypertrophic cardiomyopathy represented the greater proportion of sudden cardiac death in competitive athletes. And also this data can be a bit biased. The reality is that if you look at a recent analysis and review that Jonathan Dresner published together with our group, indeed, if you look at different populations, and you can see that one of the studies here is the study that uh, Anil Malota presented to you earlier, the incidence of mortality due to sudden cardiac death in young athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be anything from zero to 5% per annum. 
So it's not to be underestimated and it still requires a bit of caution. However, again, even for competitive athletes, we do have some encouraging data. This is a study by Antonio Pelliccia from Italy, where he collected nine athletic individuals who were identified with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They were all advised to stop competitive sport. 60 of them did, but 27 continued with regular competition. And the result was that after seven years of follow-up, to experience a sudden cardiac death from the non-competitive uh, group that was not related to exercise. And there was no significant difference even in terms of arrhythmias and development of new symptoms between the two cohorts. I will caution, however, if you look at the box up here, that most of them were at very low year series score and they had a mean age of about 31 years and most of them were white and male. Now, there is another study by Rachel Lampert from the American and European group that they looked at 440 athletic individuals who received a defibrillator due to an inherited cardiac condition. And you will see that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is very well represented in this population. However, the point is that despite the fact that they were obviously considered at high risk to receive a defibrillator, the HCM patients did very well despite continuing with regular competition and it was only ARVC that was associated with increased risk of shocks during competition and practice. Now, moving on from the evidence, I'll tell you how we go about prescribing exercise in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in a, a very uh, structured approach. Step one is do a comprehensive evaluation. Detailed history and physical examination is necessary and I've highlighted here for you some of the markers that will indicate increased risk. ECG does not contribute to risk, but it is uh, something that we do on a regular basis. The transthoracic echocardiography, a very useful tool, wall thickness, atrial size, LVOT gradient are all included in the ESC risk calculator. Do an exercise test to assess your hemodynamic response to exercise, the presence of arrhythmias, and very importantly, to look at the functional capacity of your athlete, and an ECG monitor to check for arrhythmias, and please try, if possible, to include a training session or a competition. There is no way that you will be able to reproduce in your lab what happens during a football game. And finally, we've got a cardiac MRI that has an increased role, in the context of detecting fibrosis and even potentially ischemia. And there are arguments and counter arguments as to how much fibrosis contributes to the restratification in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, once you do that, then you can go to your ESC risk calculator and you can find that online. It's freely available. You can put the demographics, the echocardiographic indices, the family history, the presence or absence of non-sustainability of your uh, athletic individual, and it will come up with a number over the five-year risk. Now, I do recognize that this was not designed for athletic individuals, but this is essentially the best available evidence that we've got at this point. So you can interpret this calculator, and that's what the guidelines done, as low if it's less than 4% over five years, medium if it's 4 to 6 percent or high risk if it's more than 6 percent. Then you need to make a recommendation and remember that you need to have a good discussion with the, uh, your patient or the athletic individual and try and take a holistic approach to the decision making, trying to balance safety versus personal choice. And I can tell you that of very competitive athletes, that decision can be extremely complex and lots of individuals may need to be involved. This sort of decision should be made in expert centers because at the end of the day, when you don't have solid evidence, you need to have support from an MDT discussion. Now, how will you make your recommendation? These are the guidelines from 2020. And what they highlight is that for HCM individuals who are considered at low risk, participating in competitive sports and high intensity is possible, and those are the risk markers. For those who have risk markers, 
they should try and avoid competitive sport and concentrate on low to moderate intensity recreational exercise. And for gene positive phenotype negative, competitive sport can be considered. And this is the exercise prescription. I'm just presenting that to you as an example of what you should try to provide to your patient. And you know, don't just say moderate intensity exercise because that doesn't mean really much to your patient. OK, so try to provide by the fit principle. How often at what intensity, what type of sports and how uh, long can they do it at every time? OK. Now, number four, don't forget once you've made the diagnosis and the recommendation, monitoring is important. We usually monitor individuals once a year, particularly the exercise on a regular basis, and I'm particularly concerned about testing for arrhythmia uh, in those individuals. But don't forget that emergency response planning is necessary. Educate them about symptoms and how to look after themselves in terms of hydration, potential supplements they may use, and avoid uh, performance enhancing substances. Now, a word of caution, Nabil highlighted for you that you need to get the diagnosis right. Not all left ventricular hypertrophy or T-wave inversion is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Be aware of increased risk in younger adolescent individuals and those who play those start-stop sports like football and basketball and question what are you trying to achieve here and I come back to the multiple choice question that I told you in terms of trying to encourage that individual to participate in recreational exercise. Now very briefly before I finish I would like to highlight that in terms of the dilated cardiomyopathy and left ventricular non-compaction they follow the HCM paradigm. So if you are asymptomatic, considered to be at low risk, you can participate in high intensity exercise. Otherwise, you have to re-stratify them and prescribe exercise accordingly. The story is very different for arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, as we do have accumulating evidence that high intensity exercise and endurance sports tend to expedite the expression of the condition and increase the risk, and as such, Competitive sport and high intensity exercise are not recommended by the guidelines. And unfortunately, that's the case even for genotype positive, phenotype negative individuals. Now, very briefly before I finish, I can only present you a summary slide for ion channel opathies, but we can have a discussion potentially later on. But as far as Brugada syndrome is concerned, there are not many concerns with exercise. So we're pretty relaxed about participating in high intensity exercise and competitive sport, taking certain precautions into account. For long QT syndrome, again, there is a divide between US and Europe in terms of the US are more relaxed in terms of allowing exercise even for those who have significant QT prolongation. But the message I think is that once you have beta blocked your athlete, which can be a major challenge and they're well treated, then they can potentially participate in competitive sport. With CPVT, for obvious reasons, because it is stimulated by the adrenaline surges, competitive sport is not recommended. Uh, it may be possible a moderate intensity exercise when they're optimally controlled on beta blocker therapy. So in conclusion, recommendations for competitive sport in head cardiac conditions follow a structured approach. So have a look at the document. They allow for self-determination as we do in every other aspect of medicine and cardiology. They gradually become more liberal for most cardiomyopathies, long QT syndrome and Brugada syndrome, but remain very restrictive for ARVC and CPVT. Very important message that all individuals with heart disease should be encouraged to participate in regular physical activity. And please try and take a structured approach to your exercise prescription. And in terms of the future, I think for competitive athletes, we need more data from registries. But for leisure time physical activity, we can move to multi-center studies to have greater numbers of patients. And if you're really interested in sports cardiology, then have a look at our MSc in sports cardiology at St. George's University of London. And also a bit more advertising for our CRI International Conference, 
as well as the European Association of Preventive Cardiology, where sports cardiology at European level falls under and there is lots of educational material. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Michael, um, for that excellent presentation. And, um, you know, I think uh, any, anyone I would encourage to read those guidelines, the 2020 ESC guidelines are excellent. Um, and it's a real kind of paradigm shift, isn't it, from the previous prescription where anyone with cardiomyopathy or channelopathy was, was pretty much barred from doing competitive exercise, now has moved to a much more um, individualized approach based on risk stratification. Um, again, from years of data, that exercise can be very safe, actually, in people with ICCs. Um, and Michael, are you able to stay for a little bit for the um, MDT? I think, um, thank you, Michael. Uh, thanks again for your talk. Um, 